Up next, the Bellhop's initial thoughts on Vinhouse Deluxe from Eagle Griffin Games. All right, first things first, thank you, Eagle Griffin Games, for providing me with a review copy of Vinhouse Deluxe at Origins. I've been wanting to check this game out for a long time. It came out in 2016, though originally was released in 2010. This is an update of the 2010 edition. Now, I do need to point out that this is an initial impressions review. This is just my first thoughts on the game. I've only played the game a couple times so far. I will be planning on doing a full review after I've gotten to the game to the table a bit more often and with some different player accounts. Yeah, so this game has got a lot of buzz. Uh, for those of you not uh, familiar with your Portuguese, Vinhos <laughs> is the Portuguese word for wine. Uh, now, with uh, 3, 000, uh, over 3,000 ratings, this is an 8.2 on yeah. Board Game Geek, and it's got a weight of 4. So this is not your you know mom's light, uh, no. lightweight table game. Not at all. All right, so physically... Vinhos is big. It is a big box, a big, awkward box that I still haven't figured out where the heck I'm going to put it on my shelves. Now, this isn't like Gloomhaven type. It's different. It's thinner and bigger. It kind of looks like the Lords of Waterdeep part box, but it's actually wider and it's way heavier. There is a ton of cardboard in this box. Bring it home. It's ridiculous. When you buy this game, the lid doesn't fit on purpose. Like it's packaged so that once you take a punch, all the stuff and put it in the right spots, it does shut. It's that big. There is so much stuff. Now, once you do punch everything, it fits great, which is cool. Now, the box also comes with a box insert, which is pretty cool. Uh, it's not the best insert I've seen, but it's way better than what most publishers provide. Uh, it's a great storage solution for the various player components in the vineyards. But then everything else is just a bunch of open compartments that are generic, and you can kind of put what you want in them. Uh, I guess it's no custom insert. It's no, you know, Meeple Reel two-folded space or anything like that, but it works. Excellent. Uh, it's always good, you know, when you're when your game, especially a game that's got this many pieces in it, yeah. has at least something to give you a fighting chance to keep it organized. Because yeah. yeah. again, with when you get to this size, baggies alone are still a, a little bit unwieldy. Uh, you need a little bit more than that. And what's nice is it has a lid. Like there's you put all the stuff in the insert, and then you put a plastic lid on it. So I could stand this on its edge, which again won't fit where I want to fit it. My shelves aren't tall enough. I, I'll find somewhere to put it. Now, the actual components in the game are great. Um, the first thing I noticed when I'm punching this game is this is some of the thickest cardboard I've ever seen. All the tiles and tokens are meaty and easy to pick up and easy to handle because of this. Wooden components are solid. Uh, player colors are colorblind friendly, which is always a nice touch. So Deanna's getting really sick of games she can't play green in anymore. Uh, money is represented by chits. I got to say, I kind of wish that was metal coins. But the chits represent paper bills, so it'd be kind of weird having a metal version of paper bills. And, well, everyone hates paper money, so I get why they went with chits. So I can't really complain. I just feel like if with the Deluxe Edition, I want that tactile, clinky sound. Right. I don't know. But the money's supposed to be paper, so I get it. Uh, the board, colorful without being garish, and the iconography is actually fantastic. Like, really good. When teaching the game, it was really easy to be able to point stuff on the board, and it just made sense. It's interesting, actually, as you were saying that, I was flipping through some pictures on Board Game Geek, and the picture I was on was someone who had already swapped metal uh, tokens in for their, <laughs> their There bills. you go, metal coin. Um, now, I have to say, the one thing I definitely notice with the thickness of the cardboard, and there's no question, this is thick cardboard, yeah. is I would be wary of moisture, like even more yeah. than most. Uh, this is the kind of thick cardboard where because you've got all those layers in there, if it gets damp you're going to get some real buckling and strangeness happening. So that is one negative that can come with the fantastic yeah. thing that is great thick cardboard. Now it did come with, I'm probably going to pronounce this wrong, multiple desiccant packages yep. were in there from the packaging. Good. And here's a tip. Don't throw those out. Like yeah, that's yeah. a thing. Keep them in your games. I was Absolutely. dumb and didn't, but I do have a dehumidifier <laughs> in my basement now, yep. which people on our gloom stream stream <laughs> happen to notice. Um, one of the things that's going to shock you with this when you first open it is it's a fantasy, it's not a fantasy flight game, but comes with three books. Uh, two of them are rule books and the third is a reference book, which I, I've complained about this before. Um, fantasy flight does it and it just annoys me. Uh, when playing, you're going to use one book to set up and you're going to go to the rule book to look at how to play. And then in the middle of the rule book, it's going to be grab one of these tiles for what those tiles mean. Go back to that other book. So then you're going to go back to the other book and then you're going to have to go back to the rule book to keep reading. Like, like, I don't understand why they didn't just put the reference book 
in both the other books, especially for the cost of this game. Like, just give me two books, one with the, the one set of rules, one with the other set of rules, and ditch the reference list. Like, why is setup in a separate book? I don't get it. That that kind of drives me nuts. But hey, other than that, it looks fantastic. It's it's probably one of the better looking games in my collection. It's it's not quite up there with you know um, Gentis Deluxe, but it's pretty close. Uh, and I have to say, the art on the box cover is very nice. I've seen a few people using pictures of it with the board game as like on a shelf, we you know yeah. like on a wine shelf sort of thing. And it doesn't stick out. It's not garish at all. It's a, it's a, the colors are muted and it has a very sort of a wine and country feel to yeah. the, to the whole art design. So it's not a game that you'd mind having out on a shelf. Yeah, fair. Now for so an actual pretty... look. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Tall. Yeah. So on, on top of it, uh, uh, you know, uh, over the fireplace or something. Yeah, yeah there you um, go. So for an actual look at what comes on the, uh, in the box, check out our Vinhouse Deluxe unboxing video on YouTube. All right, so the game looks good. How's it play? Uh, this is a heavy game, definitely heavy, but I wouldn't call it complicated. I, I definitely found this easier to learn and teach than Anachrony. If you want to hear my thoughts on Anachrony, listen two episodes back. Um, my first play, we played a single two-player game using the 2016 Vintage Rules. So now I mentioned the two rule books before. The game comes with two sets of rules. This edition is an update to the original 2010 release. And it comes with an updated set of rules, uh, the 2016 rules, but it also comes with a tweaked version of the original 2010 rules, which is called the 2010 Reserve, sticking to the whole wine thing. Now, the 2016 rules we used are the default and somewhat lighter and more accessible. From what I remember, the weight of the original rules is like 4.6 or something like that, or 4.5. All right. Now, Veen Host plays out over six rounds, each representing a year. Each round, you're going to get two actions, only two actions. Actions are selected by moving a meeple on something they call a quadrille. Now, I know a lot of gaming terms. I've never heard the term quadrille before. I don't know if they made it up for this game or if it's a mechanic that's in anything else. I'd actually be curious. If anyone else has played a game with a quadrille, let me know. So what the quadrille is in this, and possibly at all quadrilles, is a three-by-three three grid where you have a worker playing piece in the middle. You move your worker each round. You can move to an adjacent square. That's free. But moving two squares costs you one dollar or one bagos. The money's called bagos in this. I'm assuming that's a Portuguese word. Also, if you move on to a square with another player, you have to pay them a buck. Finally, there's a round marker that moves through the years. So it's going to be on one of the eight squares. It's going to be one of six of the eight squares. And if it's there, you have to pay the bank a buck. Now, the actual actions on those nine spots include buying new vineyards, Building a winery or an estate, on, sorry, on an estate, building a winery, buying new vineyards, uh, selling wine to the local market, shipping wine overseas, building a cellar, hiring farmers or onologists, hiring wine experts, or passing. And when you pass, you can also send a press release. Okay. Now, without getting into too much detail, since this is just an initial thoughts review, you basically buy vineyards to make wine. Add wineries, sellers, farmers, and enologists to improve the quality of your wine. Sell wine to make you money. Ship wine to make you victory points. Press releases are for wine tasting competitions that happen three times during the game. And wine experts give you bonus actions and help you during the wine tastings. Now, weather and the whims of the wine magnates also has an impact on the wine quality and value. Wine tastings are worth mentioning because they're a huge part of the game. Three times during the game, there's a wine tasting festival. Players each submit one wine, which scores points based on its value. Players can use experts to boost that value depending on what quality the judges are looking for that year, and it changes every year. Points are awarded based on the rank, and players can unlock wine barrels if their wine meets the criteria of the wine magnates. Now, this criteria changes every turn. So one of the wine magnates will want either a white, red, white or a red wine, Another one will want wine from a specific region, and a third one will want wine of a certain quality. Now, after each festival, players can sell wine to purchase magnate action tiles and multiplier tiles. Magnate action tiles let you take extra actions, because remember, you can only take two a turn, so they're huge. And multiplier tiles are for end game scoring. So I, I've, uh, some people are talking about how the, uh, the game feels a little restrictive in... Uh, um... Sorry, and I, and I think these are, 
I honestly think these are people finding finding things to pick at for no particular reason. <laughs> but the 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 sort of ability set and the the limitations on movement is a problem. Is that? Uh, I wouldn't. I a problem. I think is wrong. I think it's. I don't know if I call it a feature, but it's it's that is the game. Right. It is tight. It is hard. It is hard to get the right action without having to pay someone, and it's hard to predict what the other players are doing. I, I, I guess I would say it's a feature of the game. I wouldn't say it's a highlight of the game, but to me, that's part of this quadrille, and that's part of what it is. Like, I think if you don't like that aspect, you shouldn't be playing Vinhos. It's not for you. Yep. So I realized that was a big blah of a bunch of mechanics, and that's pretty much it. it there is a lot going on on Vinhos. The thing is, when you're sitting down, when it's there in front of you and you can see all the things, it's never too much. It doesn't feel overwhelming. The individual actions, and there weren't even nine of them, even though there's nine spots, there's eight different actions, are all pretty simple. Like each one, like buying a vineyard, you spend your money and you pick two vineyards and you have your vineyards. Buying a winery, you take a winery tile and put it on one of your estates, done, right? Like they're all very simple. And there aren't any like chain interactions, right? Like I think a tale to walk in, which is complicated because, oh, because I did this, I have to remember to do that because I, that doesn't happen in Vinos. You just, you do the thing, done. I, I, I bought a cellar from one of my wineries, done. I paid the money, I take the cellar, I'm done. It's very simple. All of the complexity and weight actually comes out into figuring out how to use those actions and what to do and what's more effective for you to do. And like you mentioned, knowing where to move and realizing that you're not going to be able to sell this wine because there's three other people there and you don't have any money. And what you can do to mitigate that, because that actually happened to me in my second play I spent all my money and realized I can do nothing because I have no money left. So I have to take the pass action. And I ended up having to Google it because at the time I was thinking I'm going to spend the rest of the game just taking the pass action over and over while you guys play. Mm -hmm. And then I realized the pass action lets me determine my player order. And by doing that, I can make sure I play after everyone moves out of the sell action and then get back into the game, which is really cool. Like I totally missed it having read the rules and played the game once. The second play, I made this mistake is like, I'm sunk. I'm done. I thought I did the power grid thing where I spent all my money so I can't buy any more power grids and I can't buy any of the tools to power my power grid. And I walked myself out of the game. No, the game accounts for this. Yes, I got punished. I had to pass and not get something that turn. And it might have cost me the game, but at least I wasn't out. Right. So this is just an example of the kind of things you're thinking about, right? You have a lot to think about. So you have a white wine with quality six. Now what do I do with it? Do I build a cellar to make its quality go up by one now and more every round if I let it sit in cellar? Or do I sell it right now so I can have that $6 so I can buy another vineyard? Or maybe that's the wine I should be sending to the tasting festival because the magnates really want a white with a value of six or more. That's the kind of decisions you have to make. Right. No, it's interesting. I, I what I'm What I'm seeing in comments is a lot of people uh, sort of battling it out over which version of the rules is the tighter, better version. Yeah. Uh, that there's a whole yeah, fight between 2010, that. 2016, uh, with, with people coming down on both sides, uh, for various reasons. So yeah. At this point, like I said, the initial thoughts, I've only played the 2016, uh, the 2010 seems to be more of the, the heavy gamers game seems to be the 18 XX players like it. There is a bank. And there is investment involved, which is not part of the version I played. Uh, the wine festival, I guess, is completely different. So I haven't seen that. Right. And I asked people what I should start with. And the vehement reply was start with 2016. But yeah. lots of people also said, then move on to 2010 as quick as you can, because it's better. Yeah, so, that, that's, that, that was sort of the feeling I was getting from, from reading through comments and, and suggestions was, you know, for the real, you know, heavy gamer lovers, um, 2016 is the easy intro, get yeah. into the flow of the game and then, and then jump back to the 2010, um, uh, comments like, you know, they, they, they polished off some of the rough edges that made 2010 a better game and more enjoyable sort of thing. Yeah. And supposedly the deluxe version of 2010 is significantly better than the original, even though the original was good is right. what I've read through is the tweaks that get, they called them tweaks really help. Right. But overall, like even the 2016 is, is a tight, unforgiving game. It's one of those games where you can't do all the things and this is worse than most. Like you, there's no way you can do all the things. Like don't even right. try to think <laughs> you're going to get to have an estate that's going to have farmers and onologists and, and all the wineries and a cellar and produce 20 wines every turn. It's just not going to happen. Right. You only get two actions a year and you're only playing for six years. 
And you got to make those two actions count. And it's tough. Like you are, you don't only have to watch like the board state, right? You're not only just watching the weather and the women of the magnates, but you have to be keenly aware of how much money you have on hand and how much money you're going to need. And you have to do all this while watching your opponents because which actions they take is going to directly impact your cost. And like you, uh, there's just so much to think about. Like there is trying to figure out what wine your opponent's going to send to the tasting fair. Like it's crazy. It's, it is a brain burner. And the one thing that the biggest caveat is if you don't like heavy games, you're probably not going to enjoy this. But if you have a group that has AP issues who like to plan out every little thing, Back this off. can can take a long time. Like, make sure everyone's cool with that. Yeah. Because, uh, yeah, what is the, the playtime on it? Is... It's a weird one. It's like two hours and 15 minutes, I think is what BGG said. Uh, 60 to 135. Yeah. Like I said, yeah. it's a weird weird yeah. number it took deanna and i three hours to play our two hour two player game but that did involve it's having to teach her the rules yeah. and and uh, it's and, and i've uh, there's there are some comments saying it's it's a rough one to teach and until you get into it and start playing it's one of those games where yeah. it's it's rough um but and, we, and again we've, we've covered the problems with the the multiple rule books and it's definitely easier to teach though than a game like anachrony there's just not as many interactions even right. though i'm sure anachrony's weight's way lower but just teaching it, Teo to Watkins, another example. It doesn't have that the chain, right? Like that's always hard to teach. Is the yep. when you do this, you get this, and because you got that, you get this. Venus doesn't have that. It's you did this, you get this. You do that, you get this. You do that, you get that. And the complexness, the complexity is from shoot, I wanted to do that, but now Sean's there. What the heck do I do now? Right? right. Like that's where it comes in. And even better is the taking it to the next level, going, ooh, I knew Sean was gonna move there. Right. Or, you know, right, and predicting what your opponents are gonna do. Now, I realize I covered a lot. Like, I explained a lot of stuff here, and that is nothing compared to the amount of detail I went in on the actual blog post. Like, there's even more detail there. I really go into detail of the tasting festivals and the magnates and how to make them happy. And I talk about barrels and why you want more barrels and stuff like that. So this this was still, even though I know it was a lot of info, still just kind of scratching the surface of Vinos. All right. Well, to read that, head over to the tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews.